Um, so I want to introduce the session. This is from Mayhem to Magic, from Prison to Production. Um, uh, Grant Packwood, uh, Brandy Smith, and Varinja Morales uh, are uh, here from Arrowette. Uh, Grant Packwood is a 30-year-old vet, you're a 30-year-old Arizona native. He's Arrowette's Director of Community Affairs, who has dedicated his post-college career to public service, first working for three years in the Arizona State Senate and spending another three working in the nonprofit sector. He is a strong believer in second chances and thinks everyone should be as well uh, because we have all needed one point or another in our lives. Uh, he's also requested to go first for this presentation because he could never follow an act like Brandy in Virginia. Uh, Brandy Smith is a 47-year-old uh, California native, but has lived in Arizona for almost 35 years, a lifelong untreated substance abuse problem and a list of white-collar offenses led to her three terms of incarceration for a total of 15 years. She was recently released in 2017 and in January ended a 17-year cycle caught in the criminal justice system. Her passion for second chances and re-entry made her a perfect fit for the program and outreach manager at Arrowette. She is now responsible for a comprehensive re-entry program for incarcerated women so that they can have a fighting chance to reunite with their families and communities and stop the cycle of recidivism. As a local, as a vocal advocate for recovery, she's celebrating eight years clean and sentencing reform when she isn't out trying to change the world. She enjoys spending time with her husband and two dogs and binge watching Netflix. Virginia Morales uh, is a 48 year old uh, directly impacted person and avid participant in the Arrowette transition program. She has served 17 collective years in the Arizona Department of Corrections and now has a thriving career, healthy relationships, and lends her voice to raising awareness regarding transition and all it entails. She has faced many challenges since transition, including finding housing and reestablishing relationships with her adult daughter. Along with those challenges, she is learning how to use her story to help others, advocating for sentence reform, and she is looking forward to year three of the Arrowette program and paying forward the gift of mentorship she received. Uh, please give me a great HSGP welcome for uh, Grant, Brandy, and Virginia. Uh, Grant, you are up first. As requested, great. Uh, Hello everyone, I'm Grant Packwood. I'm gonna share a very quick little uh, PowerPoint here, please. Uh, please bear with me. I'm not super good at Zoom, but I'm pretty sure I can, I can handle this. Can everybody see it? You have awesome. handled it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm Grant Packwood. I'm the Director of Community Affairs at Arrowette. And what I'm here to talk to you about is just a quick little introduction into Arrowette, who we are, what we do, and then hand off to Brandy and Virginia who will take care of the telling their stories portion of the day. Uh, so Arrowette was founded in 2011 to meet a recognized need within a population of women who were working in call centers inside of Perryville Prison in Arizona. In Arizona. So those women upon release were met with all of the challenges that people face when they have left prison. And a great many of those challenges become so burdensome and so insurmountable that a full 38% of people in Arizona recidivate, which means return back to prison within three years. With Arrowhead programming, we've been able to cut that number to under 10%. And we have done that through a through a array of programs that are meant to empower women, integrate the workspace, restore and reunify communities that have been destroyed by the cycle of incarceration. Um, let's see if I can use this. There we go. So this slide shows the so we refer to it as the Arrowette wheel. It is the six spokes of Arrowette, the so six primary tools we use to help reduce recidivism throughout Arizona and help to and give the women that we serve the second chance that they deserve. We do that through advocacy and storytelling, which is what we're here for today. Uh, 
a reentry success model, which it means that people being picked up at the gate, they have clothes, they're taken around to do those first day errands that can really be a make or break it when it comes to a successful release. And those days can range from having to go to DMV and social security and somehow get to your parole board and to your second chance housing all before like five o'clock. It can be a little bit of a tough day. And I think people don't recognize how valuable that is. And that's one of our programs that we have volunteers support us with. We have a career center, which involves employee training. We do job placement, resume building, workshops on interview skills, all sorts of skills that are necessary to acquire employment in today's economy. And I mean, with what's happening right now, we don't really know how many more skills people are going to need. So having that support is going to be key to getting women into the workforce. We work in educational attainment, so professional development, encouraging people to acquire new education, new skills. Our three-year transition model, which began six months to a year inside Perryville Prison, and we work with them building soft skills, developing the necessary coping mechanisms to handle what reentry will be like before reentry. And then the second year is all about being mentored and being someone who has success successfully re-entered and then the third year is about developing that leadership and becoming a mentor yourself so and there will be more about that in the next slide uh, and then finally we have our financial opportunity center which is all about developing healthy financial literacy healthy financial planning budgeting skills teaching them how to do credit repair oftentimes we'll have volunteers go with them to when they are buying a car just to make sure that they're doing treated fairly because a lot of these women haven't had that opportunity before. They didn't have someone more experienced than them in their lives to help them acquire things like cars or house loans or whatever the case may be. So then here is our three-year transformational model. So the preparing for reentry, the reentry foundation, and that's all about developing the core of a successful reentry, right? And we start in the prison and make sure to build a plan for them so it's not just being thrown, you know, just exiting the gate and not knowing where you're going, what you're doing, who to call. And then after you get through reentry, we bring you into our second year program, which allows for workshops, more lunch and learns, uh, activities that we will organize, group get together financial wellness that's where that foc program really plays a big part into getting their feet firmly underneath them and then finally we have our third year program which is leadership and scholarship it's it's taking all of those things that we build in the first two years and putting them that much further so it's sort of the next step off of the foundations of both of those years and that includes uh, becoming a mentor yourself, uh, advanced financial planning, so for things like uh, retirement, homes, et cetera, investments. And it's a really important part of our program, and it's the foundation of how we reduce recidivism. And then here is the quick little breakdown of where our three main components are with our first year. The focus on making sure that all three of these needs are met because we have recognized that all three of these needs, the financial opportunity, emotional health and wellness, and workforce readiness, make for a successful reentry and reduce the likelihood of recidivism. In the emotional wellness, we follow the five core practice areas. It's relationship-based, strength-based, trauma-informed, culturally responsive, and holistic. So, what we do is we make sure that everything is an individual plan for the individual things that people have space in their lives because what might have led one person to prison is not the same thing as someone else and we we recognize that and we do our very best to address all of those issues as much as possible 
Arrowet uh, is an important part of a successful reentry program in the community because we address seven of the eight needs that uh, a nationwide poll released on what the newly released need. The one thing that we don't really yet address too much of is veterans benefits, and that's just because the population we serve isn't very high in terms of service. I'm sure once that population number changes, we'll adjust and become more versed in dealing with the VA and veteran services and benefits. And so that's a quick little introduction to Arrowhead. Uh, what we're doing today is all about storytelling, so I want to make sure that we have as much time as possible for uh, both Brandy and Virginia to tell their stories. Brandy is going to go first, and I'm going to hand it off to Brandy, and I think that's it for me today. Thank you, Grant. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandy. I appreciate uh, being invited here today. Um, this is a, a, an exciting time for us. Uh, it's always a, an awesome opportunity to get to share our stories um, and try to, um, I guess, make an impact on changing the hearts and minds um, of people who maybe don't know a lot about um, incarceration. Um, so right now there are 40, over 44,000 local, state, and federal barriers to st stability for people with felony convictions, and I'm one of them. Um, I have spent over half my adult life in the criminal justice system, and being caught in the cycle of incarceration, um, it creates barriers uh, like uh, housing and access to medical care, um, community re-engagement. Um, for example, if you have a felony conviction, you are oftentimes unable um, or not allowed to volunteer in your community, right? Just to volunteer. Um, so I've faced a lot of obstacles um, in my journey, but uh, I didn't start out uh, as one of those people who you would think was most likely to fail. Um, I grew up in an upper middle class um, family. I was fortunate enough to have every opportunity uh, to succeed. Um, I was a straight A student. I had a two parent household, um, safe, uh, no domestic violence, no abuse, nothing like that. Um, so I literally um, had every opportunity to succeed. So um, when we're talking about incarceration, uh, you can really believe me when I say that it can literally happen to anyone. Um, there are a lot of pieces uh, to my story, um, but I'm going to skip ahead to when I was a teenager. Um, my substance abuse um, addiction, it was really an unknown monster um, to my um, suburban parents. Um, they were very naive. Um, nobody in our family had ever had a substance abuse problem. Uh, they didn't, they did not know what they were dealing with. Um, they, they tried to support me. Um, they were supporting what they thought was a mental health issue, um, which now um, in this current day, they are really starting to connect um, mental health disorders to substance abuse addiction. They are tied very closely. Um, but back in the 80s and 90s, um, that wasn't the case. Um, so they, in trying to support me, um, I was the oldest of five girls. Um, what they ended up doing was enabling me, right? Um, they intervened in, in a lot of things. They threw a lot of money at um, all of the <laughs> uh, interesting situations I found myself in. Um, and even though I have been doing drugs since um, before I could drive a car, um, I did not end up going to prison until I was 29. Um, at that point, geez, it was, it was a lot of um, broken dreams, I would say, for my parents and for myself. Um, I, because I was a straight A student and on drugs, um, I had a free ride to NAU. Um, and because of my addiction, um, I ended up derailing from that path. 
Um, so all the things that um, this upper middle class family thought that they were going to provide for me, um, they, they never materialized. So um, broken dreams, a lot of broken promises, um, bad choices on my part, um, and definitely a debilitating um, drug addiction. It finally forged my path uh, to a concrete cell in Goodyear, Arizona in 2003. Um, I had spent uh, three years incarcerated the first time. Um, my incarceration wasn't the only reason that my family fell apart, um, but it did play uh, a big part in it. Anytime uh, someone is incarcerated, uh, they are not the only one doing time. Um, their entire family is. Uh, everything is scheduled around going to visit, sending money, phone calls, uh, what's going on, with with their loved one who's in prison. Uh, so my family um, definitely did as much prison time as I did. Um, so my family, uh, my parents ended up uh, getting divorced. Um, so my family was falling apart. Um, I had um, two of my youngest siblings um, out on the street, also on drugs. Um, I really thought that at that point that the, I had hit rock bottom, right? There, there wasn't any, there couldn't possibly be any further for me to fall. Um, but with my felony conviction, um, I, I hadn't tried to re-enter yet. I hadn't um, tried to come home now with this shiny new felony conviction. Um, and I had no idea what I was in for. Um, I tried to do things different uh, when I got out of prison the first time, um, even though I had an offer of family support. Um, like I mentioned, um, my family inadvertently was enabling me. Uh, they were con constantly covering for me, um, paying legal fees, um, bailing me out of jail, um, paying my bills for me. Um, I had a, a trust fund um, for part of my adult life, so. I had no work ethic. Um, so what, all the things that my parents had tried to do for me and for my siblings, um, they, it wasn't, it, it wasn't enough, right? Um, so I wanted to try and stand on my own um, and take care of myself. Um, so when I was released from prison the first time, um, I had a check for $136. Um, I had a 10 day uh, temporary prison ID, not a state ID and um, the set of clothes that my sister had brought me. Um, so I figured I could stay the night at my dad's. Um, I'll get to see my kids, get something to eat. Um, my kids, when I went to prison, were nine and 11. Um, and so they were uh, 15 and t about 12 and a half, 13 um, when I came home. Uh, so I came home to teenagers that had had just enough time to um, be mad at me, right? I was I was gone. I had I had chose drugs um, over them, and so I figured that uh, after that first night, I could stay at my dad's. Um, I would get out the next day. Um, I'd be back to normal in no time, right? I can find a job fairly quickly. Um, and I found out how incredibly hard it was to do things on my own. Um, and that is the case for thousands of uh, people coming out of incarceration that have no family. Uh, they are coming out of prison with literally, in most cases, less than $136 to their name um, and just the clothes on their back and forced to figure out how they're going to fend for themselves, right? Um, so I found out the next day that it's incredibly hard to cash any kind of a check um, without a state ID. Um, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a way to pay for the bus. I didn't have um, a way to go check in for probation. Uh, so you have um, for if you're released on parole, which means you're still um, under state custody, then you have 24 hours to report. Um, and in some cases, you have to report that same day that you're released. Um, and for probation, you have 72 hours. Um, so the clock was ticking for me. I didn't have a way um, to, to get anywhere. I, couldn't even cash my $136 check. Um, I was wearing the same clothes um, from the day before. I had repeatedly turned down offers um, from my family. Um, I figured like, I can do this on my own. How hard can it be, right? I'm a pretty smart girl. 
Um, I should be able to figure it out. But I remember um, that next day after I was released and sitting on the steps at my dad's house and tears were just dripping down my face um, because I was free from prison, but I had, I was defeated, right? Um, so with limited options and resources available, um, I held out only a few days before accepting help from my family. Um, my dad ended up helping me um, by getting me a vehicle. Um, my mom got me into a condo. Um, I also had to go to work for my mom's uh, company because my new felony convictions uh, were block walls against meaningful employment. Um, you can't even, back then, it's, it's different now, but back then you couldn't even work at McDonald's or you couldn't work, you couldn't hardly work anywhere. There was a felony conviction will keep you from working in most cases um, in the early 2000s. Um, so I was very lucky to have my family, um, but my felonies had automatically excluded me from my entire community. Um, I would say definitely my spirit was broken. Um, I would end up returning to incarceration about 18 months later, uh, caught again in my addiction. So um, all the support that I had, um, it couldn't keep me away from the lure of illegal drugs. Um, and those drugs kept me from having to look inward at myself. Um, instead of looking outward um, for someone to blame, it was addiction, unfortunately, it was always everybody else's fault. Everybody's doing this, you know, it's, uh, it's what everybody else is doing to me that's causing me to be making these choices and having this type of behavior. Um, so my drug addiction um, and then the revolving door of prison that I ended up being in um, cost me some very precious things, um, which I took for granted. Um, and I can never get those back. Um, one of the things, um, just before I went to prison the third time, um, I saw my uh, only son at Thanksgiving at my dad's house. And my, my addiction had taken a heavy toll on my kids. Um, they had bounced back and forth um, from whatever apartment I happened to be living in and my parents' house. Um, they'd been caught in the same revolving door as me. Um, and I was just too wrapped up in my addiction to even notice. Um, so Thanksgiving um, 2011 was the last time uh, that I spoke to my son. Uh, he was 18, he was getting ready to go to boot camp. Um, we had an argument and he told me that if I ever went back to prison, he would never speak to me again. Um, I went back to prison not even 30 days later. And um, nine years later, uh, up till today, he has kept that promise. Um, he has a family of his own now, and um, I have a grandson that I have never met, um, who I'm, um, I'm the outside looking in, I'm watching him grow up through other people's pictures and other people's contact with him. Um, so I have never got to meet him, um, and that is a relationship that might never be repaired. Um, that Thanksgiving day was also the last time uh, I would see my dad face-to-face. -face. Uh, he was diagnosed with colon cancer on the beginning of 2011, and he begged me to um, get treatment and get help and get my life together um, to do something. And um, to be honest with you, I never thought that the, the best man that I ever knew um, wouldn't be around to see me succeed. Um, to see me, I didn't, I guess I didn't think that he was ever not going to be around forever. Um, sorry, he, um, he died nine months before I was released from prison and he never got to see the person that I am today. So, um, he never got to see his oldest child be something more than a drug addict. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I was about halfway through, um, this last prison sentence. I got sentenced to seven years. Um, I was about halfway through before I really started to work on myself. 
Um, for the first time in prison, I started trying to be the person that I wanted to be, not the person that I had always been. Um, I took a lot of college courses. I participated in a six month uh, long substance abuse program. I worked really, really hard at being trustworthy and responsible, um, things I had never done. Um, I learned how to have a work ethic, um, be accountable for my actions. Um, I worked on communication and empathy and selflessness and stepping outside my own bubble that I've lived in all my life. Um, so I finally figured out how it felt, how great it feels to be a giver to other people instead of a taker. Um, I was a taker my whole life. So uh, my life today is very different. Um, I was released from prison uh, April 30th, 2017. Uh, so I am about three weeks away from beating the uh, three-year recidivism uh, statistic. Um, this, yay! <laughs> um, this is the best I've ever done for the longest um, that it, in my life. Um, I, as uh, was mentioned in my in my bio from Ron, uh, I celebrated eight years clean in December, uh, clean and sober. Um, I think I haven't had, uh, prior to this, I think I maybe could piece together 30 or 60 days of sobriety at a time. Uh, never thought that um, eight years um, would happen for me. And kind of makes me feel dumb. It took me so long to figure it out because it's actually a lot easier to keep your life together than to constantly be having it fall apart, right? Um, so I'm not just, an employee um, of Arrowette. Um, I am an example um, that this reentry program works. Uh, I was given a peer mentor when I came home. Um, and a peer mentor means, uh, in our case, someone who was also previously incarcerated. And the value that that person provides, um, I still had uh, some family. Um, I had burned a lot of bridges, um, and it, it, those relationships are still. Um, slow to be repaired, uh, but to have someone to come home to that really has done it, right, has tried to re-enter society, and for me, re-entering society and dealing with basic things, sober, for the first time in my life, um, that, um, that person was of utmost value to me, uh, made all the difference. Um, so over the course of um, my 25 year drug addiction, um, I had faced a lot of challenges, but like I said, uh, never sober on uh, things like getting a flat tire, um, putting your bills on auto pay, uh, all those responsible basic things that people, regular people do every single day. Um, I kind of need to have my hand held, right? I didn't know. I didn't know how to pay my bills online because I never paid my own bills, right? Um, so, um, also, one of the great things that happened for me when I came home is uh, someone took a chance on me and um, rented me um, a house. Um, I, I was their first, um, first chance at giving a second chance. Um, I actually wrote them a letter. They were an older couple. I wrote them a letter um, when I was still at Perryville and just laid it all out there and said, listen, you know, I'm, I get it if you say no. Um, because there's sometimes a lot of fear around giving people a second chance. Um, but, uh, she said yes. And so I lived, um, I got, I lived in the same place for two years. Um, uh, first time that ever happened to me, uh, before I, uh, also worked with the Arrowette Foundation to rebuild my credit. And now, um, the walls you see behind me, they belong to me, uh, about my first house. Um, so that's exciting stuff. I never thought I would be one of those people to go shopping for a lawnmower, but it's kind of an exciting thing if you've never done it. <laughs> um, so housing is definitely the number one barrier on people with felony convictions. Um, and, um, so that second chance really made a big difference for me. Uh, so I'm now I'm married. Uh, I'm a homeowner. Uh, I, for the first time, am a valued member of my community instead of um, being one of those people who are outside looking in, which happens a lot for people with felony convictions. 
Um, and obviously I'm also a strong advocate for second chances. Um, Arrowette does a lot of different things and they did a lot of things for me. Um, but what they really do is they help women reunite with their families and they, they help you thrive outside of prison. Um, I spent so much time in prison that by the time I would, I would get there, I'd be like, yeah, let's go. Right. I do good. I do amazing in prison. Right. I'm, there's rules and structure and now I'm off drugs and um, I don't want to thrive in prison, right? I want to thrive outside of prison um, and Arrow at helped me do that. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that it costs the state um, about $1.1 billion a year to incarcerate people. Uh, only about one tenth of that is spent on reentry. Um, so it does take a lot of heart um, and time to run a reentry program. Um, it also takes money. Uh, it takes money for release clothes and bus passes and emergency assistance. Um, so I, um, I would hope that you have learned something new today and that um, your heart has been opened to um, second chances and people who were formerly incarcerated. Um, so I would consider supporting us with any amount. Um, five dollars um your time we we love volunteers um and if you ever get the opportunity uh to meet someone um who has been previously incarcerated um please consider opening your heart and giving them a second chance um because um again i'm brandy smith and uh, today i am thriving because i had a second chance and i appreciate your time Virginia, I'm gonna pass it over to Virginia. All right, uh, <clears throat> it was really good, Bernie. Now I've gotta keep it together. Here we go, oh, I'm so nervous. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you everyone for getting up early. And uh, wow, most 14 year olds, here we go, are getting ready to make the leap to high school. I dove headfirst into a 28 year long addiction to heroin. Um, you see, by the time I was 14, I had been verbally and physically ab abused throughout my entire childhood. And things that I can admit today, I couldn't see back then. Today, I know that it was severe trauma. Today, um, a couple of those examples, I was left at an orphanage when I was four. I was traumatized with being left at an orphanage at the age of four. It's another story for another time. I was burned with hot water for not eating my peas when I was five. I still don't eat peas. Um, so by the time I was 14, I knew, I knew with every, every piece of me that I served no purpose, that there was really no reason I didn't make a difference to anyone because the one person who's supposed to love you unconditionally found fault in my very being. And I don't want anyone to get the impression that I, that I do not love my mother. I love my mother and it took me a very long time to be able to admit that she terrorized me throughout my childhood. My hair was too curly. My skin was too dark. I didn't fit into her picture of what a perfect little family should look like. My siblings were much fairer skinned than I. They were much quieter than me. I've always had a very big personality. And no matter how she tried, she just couldn't get me to be quiet. So at 14, I ran away. And I found a group of people who were much older than me. And, and my 14-year-old self was so happy just to be wanted. Someone, anyone wanted me. And so uh, when I was introduced to heroin by this group of older people, uh, I finally felt comfortable in my own skin. And for someone who spent the majority of their life just knowing that even the way they breathed was wrong, to feel comfortable, I finally felt like I was home. And, and that led to 28 years, right, of just cycling in it out of the Arizona Department of Corrections, um, biding my time until I could get back to using heroin again. I had sunk so far into my own addiction that I truly believed that I could do nothing more than heroin. 
that was the reason why I was put on this earth. And so I set forth to be the very best little dope fiend I could be. But if you have any experience with addiction, you know that being the best in addiction don't go hand in hand. So I was in prison five times. Five times I cycled in and out of the Arizona Department of Corrections, all because of my addiction. The first time I was 24 years old and the judge had the opportunity to send me to rehab or send me to prison. She chose prison. And I'm not saying that my life would have changed at that time had I been given rehab, but I don't know that it wouldn't have. It was easier to send me to prison. And so I embraced it. And it got to the point, I mean, five times, come on, really? So it got to the point where I would tell the girls, okay, I'll be back, save my shoes. <laughs> Sounded funny then, but it wasn't so funny living that. Um, so the third time I was in prison, I found this second chance company that operated inside of, of uh, Perryville. And uh, it's really hard to get into this place, right? There's uh, 2,400 women. How many women? Are, there's a lot of women in Perryville. My, my friend Brandy's better at the statistics than I am, but there's a lot of us in there and we all want that job. And so when I applied, there was 175 women who applied and I was chosen. I got the golden ticket and for once in my life, I thought, oh my gosh, maybe there's more to me. But that was quickly squashed with all of the other ideas that were going on in my head because I was soon to be released. And you know, I'm gonna go back to do what I do before because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. What I do, what I say, how I live, doesn't really matter to anybody. So fast forward. Um, the fifth time in prison, right? Here we go again. I'm an older woman. I'm a woman of a certain age, I like to say. And uh, I knew I was looking at six and a half years for a simple property crime. You see, anytime I've been to prison, it was driven by my addiction. I do not, I do not have any victims. Um, I did not hurt anybody. It was all possession, $10 of heroin the first time, $20 of crack cocaine the second time, little things like that. And so this fifth time, I guess, you know, the criminal justice system got tired of seeing my name and I had a plea from four to 18 years. And I could not believe that my addiction could potentially cost me for all intents and purposes the rest of my life, 18 years. And so while I was sitting in jail before sentencing, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I've got all my people rallied and I've got letters coming in, testifying to what a great person I really am when I'm not on drugs. So luckily, if you, luckily, I got six and a half years, but I knew that something had to change. And I knew that, that the change had to start with me. And during this time, my mother, she passed away in 2012. And, and I honestly believe that, that that was the catalyst to allowing me to change. Because for so long, I couldn't speak about the things she did to me because it felt so disloyal. It felt like, how could I talk that way about my mother? How could I admit to someone else the way she terrorized me as a child? And it took a really long time peeling back those layers. Six and a half years would get you to thinking. And so I pulled back every layer and I, and I came to terms with, with the abuse that I suffered, but more importantly, the harm that I caused other people. You see, I have three children and I didn't raise a one of them. I chose heroin over my children. And it kills me every day to admit that, but the really cool thing is that I forgive myself for that now because that was my excuse to keep me in my addiction because what kind of woman leaves their children? And how do I deserve happiness when I walked out on the one thing that I was supposed to be good at? A lot of shame and a lot of guilt kept me wrapped in my addiction until I understood that that was not really who I was and that was the things I did to survive. You see, my whole life I thought I was such a survivor because of my childhood. And I heard someone say it yesterday. Turns out I was living my life as a victim the whole time. <laughs> Today, life is very different. Uh, on the third, uh, two days ago, I celebrated seven years of sobriety. I was released from the, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> I was released from the Arizona Department of Corrections May 14th, 2018. And it looks like I'm gonna make it to two years out. Never in my life would I think that this was possible. 
I have a career today. Um, I am a training specialist and I get to share with other people on how to, how to make some big money. And I'm pretty good at my job, which blows my mind every day because I really thought that all I could do was heroin. And the things I do to, today, I get to share my story. Today, I get to hopefully change the perception of the formerly incarcerated. And, and the one thing I'd like to say is that if it were not for second chances, I would never know that this version of my life existed. I would never know that I could do the things that I do today. And, and, I, and um, I thank you for listening. But what I would ask is that if it were not, okay, so I've been released from prison five times, right? This is the fifth time. And the huge difference maker in my life today was one, the change in my attitude that I made for myself while I was inside. The decision that I made that drugs are no longer an option. And I've had a lot of challenges raising an adult or, or being a part of an, an parenting an adult child that you did not raise. Man, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But but I love that, that my kid's asleep in her bedroom right now. I love it. Nothing makes me happier. I've got two cats, pretty responsible for them. My life is, my life is amazing. And, and, and it's because the difference maker in my transition today is the Arrowette Foundation. And I never like to say that my, I don't like to label my transition a success because it implies that it's over. And every single day, there is something new. Every single day, there's, there's you know, a, a new feeling, a new something. And, and I'll tell you, Brandy's on speed dial. Allison's on speed dial. I just emailed Grant the other day. The Arrowette Foundation, the people that make up that program keep me sane today. And I would ask that, that you consider supporting a nonprofit organization such as Arrowette. $5 can make all the difference for someone getting to a job interview. Or, or mentoring someone, showing someone that there is another side of life that it's theirs for the taking and, and just believing in someone because without that, without hope, what are we all here for? My name is Virginia Mireles. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Virginia. That was uh, powerful and beautiful. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, would we like to get into questions and answers? If anyone has a question, feel free to uh, raise your hand, uh, unmute, uh, and ask away. So one of the questions online is, did you both receive counseling or medical help uh, to overcome your addiction? Um, in the in the Department of Corrections, there are not many reentry programs, and the reentry programs that are there are they, they have a very strict like screening process as to who gets in. So for myself, no, the 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 help that I got was was my 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 friends talking with Brandy, my my going to the Arrowhead workshops. It, that's what it was about. Same with me. Um, I did take get a chance to take part uh, in women in recovery when I was incarcerated, uh, the six month program. But really um, my sobriety today is attributed to um, taking it upon myself, uh, just like in my addiction, I did whatever it took um, every single day to feed that addiction. And today I do whatever it takes to not go, to not go back. Um, so I'm super involved in recovery meetings, um, and staying connected to a sober network of friends. Um, so unfortunately um, for both uh, Virginia and I, uh, treatment was not offered uh, for both of us. Uh, the judge was really quick to say, do not pass go, um, go straight to prison. Um, even though I had um, all white collar crimes, um, every single time I went in front, of, in front of a judge, I begged them, I'm like, listen, I'm a drug addict. Like I, my, my life is out of control. And um, because I was never charged with drugs, um, they sent me straight to prison. So. So Amy Schwartz, uh, would you like to uh, ask your question? Or would you like me to ask it for you? Uh, yeah, no, I can ask it. I sent it in the chat too. It was for Brandy. You said you'd had 
you know, a pretty good childhood, and I'm curious to say, to ask you, what, what do you think got you into substance abuse? Um, so I think the reason why I started doing drugs, um, so even though um, I did have a, um, a stable home life, um, my dad was a workaholic and uh, my mom has some control issues. Um, but in any case, um, I was left unsupervised with um, most often <laughs> way more money than my friends. Um, so as you start to be a teenager, right, whoever has money, whether it started out, you know, buying a bag of weed um, or, you know, hanging out with um, some of it, I started hanging out with people that I know my mom would absolutely not allow me to do so, right? Like people wearing, you know, hanging out on the corner, smoking cigarettes um, and all that. And so some of that was a rebellion. Um, but I started doing drugs um, literally just because I was on was unsupervised and didn't have um, um, like the right guidance. Um, so I started doing uh, methamphetamine um, right uh, about the time I graduated high school. Um, and that's when I had my first child. So I was, uh, I forego, uh, I bypassed um, my college education, started going to community college. I was working a terrible um, crap job and trying to take care of a baby. And I was barely, I was 18. I was barely, so I started doing methamphetamine to have more hours in my day and try and take care of all these obligations that I was drowning in, which is not an excuse. It's my choice. But that's kind of, that's kind of what led to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan, would you like to ask your question uh, or would you like me to ask it? All right. Uh, the question is, people who need help should not be imprisoned. Uh, suggestions for changing the system? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear the question. Oh, uh, people who need help should not be imprisoned. Uh, suggestions for changing the system. <laughs> we got a meeting tomorrow night to talk about it. I'll send you the invite. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, um, so there's a lot of, just like in any system, um, there's a lot of fault lines, right? There are a lot of um, cracks in the infrastructure. Um, so uh, some of it has to do with sentencing reform. Some of it has to do with, um, a lot of it has to do with the perception that people have about people um, who commit crimes. Um, and I understand that the system, at least in Arizona, unfortunately is overloaded. Um, but that is not an excuse um, to throw people away. Mm -hmm. I think I think one thing we can do to try to help ignite change is is attending meetings like this, right? Educating ourselves, and and when you get the chance, um, don't automatically assume that 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 it's the person who was formerly incarcerated, because you know in today's world we see so many news stories about you know this person recidivated, this person got let out of prison, and they went on this horrible crime spree. But in all actuality. That's a really minor percentage of what happens. Uh, there's a ton of us, just like Brandy and I, who are just trying to figure out life. Uh, we got a late start, but we're no, no less dedicated and, and no less motivated to like get some things done. I just bought a big girl table. I can't believe it. I got a real nice dining table. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, T. Ogman, uh, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to ask it? Oh you know, my go back to you. Yeah, I just asked, can you speak to the pressures in incarceration to follow a religious path to reform and sobriety? I did a few short stints behind bars and uh, I never saw so many Christian crosses on tattoos. So I'm just interested, you know, they say secular humanists make up one of the smallest percentages of people in prison. So how, how did you deal with that pressure or? Did you deal with that pressure? Uh, go ahead. Do you want to go? Well, so I was going to say that I, I didn't really face any pressure. Mm -hmm. There's not like 
everybody just does their own thing. Maybe it's different in a man's prison, but I can tell you that I'm definitely a Christian. And about a year into my uh, stay, I got a letter from an unknown gentleman who wanted to visit his wife and him visited random people in prison. Um, that's just what they did. And so they found how they found me. I have no idea. And this man visited me for three years, every Saturday. I think he missed about two Saturdays. He's my grandpa today. And, uh, we go to church every Sunday and they truly showed me, um, what loving someone just because they're a person really meant. And I never, ever in my life did I experience that before they wanted good for me. Yes, they were Christian. They wanted good for me just because I was a person I was worthy of good things. And uh, yeah, they're family today. I love my I grandma. Can I ask a question? Please. Um, both of you say that really it wasn't anything outside that, weren't, that you made the decision to change your life. You needed the help. Once you made the decision, you needed the help. But the, ch but the actual change was from inside you. So how, and probably a lot of other people who have that inside of them, but they can't get in touch with it. How, what can, what could society do or what could the prisons do to help people who are, who are ready, but just haven't recognized that, 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 in, that they have it inside of them to do it? Because that's the first step. Mm -hmm. and how can we help? So... For people who, and I can only speak from my own experience, um, I was a super slow learner, right? <laughs> um, it took me um, to be sitting in prison for the third time in my mid-40s with um, now my kids grown. Um, my kids grew up while I was um, busy being in and out of prison. Um, so unfortunately for me, I had to, um, I lost a lot of things. Um, and I gave up a lot of my freedom and a lot of time. Um, and literally it was me sitting in prison for the third time, um, over 40 years old saying like, this has got to change. Um, I think that, um, people who have it in them to change, um, you can be supportive and make sure you're not enabling them. Um, and just remind people of all the things they have to lose because I knew them just by knowing them, but I never had anybody to say like, listen, this is what, this is what it's going to cost you. Um, and I guess in the middle of a drug addiction, it, it might not have made much difference. Um, because if it was just because my kids or just because my dad, I could have got sober and got my life together, then obviously I would have chose to do so. Um, that's not how addiction works though. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, one other question from Jim V. Jim, would you like to ans ask it? And I will. So uh, are there some signals or signs that I could look for in my students uh, at community college that might help me to identify someone in need of help? Sure. Do you want me to take that one, Virginia? It is. Um, so for me and in our community um, of, of our huge community of women who have transitioned home, um, a change in behavior, right? If someone, for example, in your students is always 10 minutes early for class and they start missing class, um, they start disengaging from other students, um, their, their behavior that they have already established, whatever it is, right? Whatever that pattern of behavior is, if it starts to change, um, those are red flags. Um, and a lot of times people will get sucked into addiction um, in their mind way before they actually start using a substance. Um, so it could be that they're struggling with something at home or they're, they're feeling lonely, um, but you will see them start to change the way that they um, have normally behaved and you will see them start to disengage um, in general. There's people who are just introverts and they just they, they don't hang out with people, and that, but that's their normal behavior, right? Um, so just keep an eye out for things that, because people don't change their general behavior just for no reason. Um, so. Jeannie, you had a question. Would you like to ask it? I know you're on. <clears throat> Oh, 
Okay, I'll ask it. Uh, did you get any help from high school counselors? If no, would that have made a difference in decisions you made in your life? I never went to high school, unfortunately. I went to high school for maybe two weeks until I found the spot where everybody smoked pot. That was the end of my high school career. Yeah, um, for me, um, a high school counselor, I don't think would have made much of a difference um, just because teenagers just regular teen, not using drugs, not like anything. They're super resistant to like people getting in their business and getting involved in what they're doing. Um, and then you add a drug addiction on top of that. So um, I got really good at um, hiding what was going on, at manipulating the adults that were around me. Um, and so even had a high school counselor, um, and I'm only speaking for myself, I'm not saying in general that they, that they can't help people. Um, but for me, um, that's, it wouldn't have made a difference. Um, I was already, um, I was already on my path of self-destruction, unfortunately. I think that that's really the most cunning part about drug addiction is that you, it, no one can pray it away for you. If that was the case, I would have been sober a long time ago. No one can wish it away for you. And even though when you have moments of clarity in your addiction, like it's, it's impossible, impossible to stop in the middle of your addiction and say, you know what, I've got to make some changes. This, this has got to happen. And you change your life. This, it's, it, it's unfortunate, but you, you have to hit whatever your own bottom is. Mm -hmm. And the most important piece is having that one person who every time you dust yourself off, they believe that, you know what, this is going to be the time. I know that this is going to be the time she gets her act together. And even if it's not, that the next time they try again, that, that we believe, that we hope, that we do everything mm -hmm. we can. Because who knew that this was going to be the time I got it? Nobody knew. Like nobody, my aunt, she didn't know that this was the time I was going to get it. But yet every single time, there she is just, you're going to get it this time. I know you are. And it's just a decision that every single person has to come to for themselves. And I don't know what that is because I gave up everything to heroin. My children, my, my family, my youth, I gave up everything to heroin willingly. And the day came when you just, you know, I, I asked a mentor, what was the one thing that would truly help me um, when I got out of prison? And he told me, practice discipline. And so now it's a big sign in my room and I practice discipline every day, every single day. And it's worked so far. So fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> no fingers crossed. I got this. It's yeah. not about luck. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So, a, uh, so how would secular humanism uh, and humanist organizations help reduce recidivism and participate with uh, incarcerated individuals? I think that uh, humanist organizations are already doing, um, you guys are already doing um, an amazing job at just staying connected on all things that make us human, right? And I think um, that just now hearing our stories, right? And the people who you come in contact with, six feet away, of course, but the people you come in contact with um, that you talk to on the phone or you talk to on a Zoom, right? Start to share the story. Start to spread the awareness um, because that's really what it comes down to on what's going to make a difference is that erasing the stigma of incarceration, right? I went to prison because I broke the law, right? I also went to prison because I wasn't offered because I was a drug addict, right? But I still broke the law. So there's accountability for that. Like, there's a price to be paid for breaking the law. Um, but the, and, and all the changes started within me, right? But if it weren't for people outside of me who were like, let's give her another chance. And to your point, um, I've had um, 784 second chances from people who know me and love me, right? Um, but I wasn't ready for those. Um, I hadn't changed anything in myself. So it's all... So I had to be, make the change within myself in order for that second chance to 
to be something that um, would really make a difference for me. You have to be, you have to be ready for it. Yeah, and I was I was going to use this to wrap up uh, in the values, but the the values of the ten commitments that this aligns with is uh, peace and social justice, right? I will help people solve problems and handle disagreements in ways that are fair for everyone, with the focus towards restorative justice, uh, responsibility. I will be a good person even when no one is looking, and own the consequences of my actions and ethical development. Uh, I will always focus on becoming a better person. Um, these are values of secular humanism and directly relate to uh, the stories of these amazing women. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I am very privileged to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It was Thanks great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was so much fun. Thank you, everyone. Can I ask yeah. another question? Thank you. Oh, yeah, please do. Uh, a few years ago, I sent a note to the prison Maricopa County saying, I'd be happy to do some uh, English language tutoring, you know, go into the prison and do that sort of thing. I never heard back. Is that something that is needed in a prison? I know this is not an addiction question. It's more because I'm an English teacher. Right. And um, sure. So I would think that it absolutely is something that's uh, useful along with um, helping people get their GED um, getting their, even their eighth grade mandatory education, which you need in order to um, be released with your good time in the state of Arizona. Um, I would recommend reaching out to uh, Rio Salado Community College. They are the ones who um, provide uh. the majority of the um, educational programming, at least at Perryville, um, but it's a really good place to start. Yeah, I work for a community <laughs> college, but I hadn't thought about Rio Salado. Yeah. They do all the distance learning out there for Perryville, and um, they um, uh, were going out there and meeting um, one on one with people and doing classes. Yeah. So I, I guess there. it's all distance learning now. It's everything <laughs> distance learning. That's right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, any other questions? Yes. I would like to uh, ask something about. Go for it. I, uh, both of your stories uh, were very, very touching and, and, and very deep. And thank you for both for coming here and, and uh, you know, laying bare your, your souls. And uh, it's very uh, heartwarming to hear how you finally, you know, come through all that. And at least you are building a new life. Um, both of you came into the legal system because of the drug war. And... Mm -hmm. There are people who will s listen to your story and who will say, well, see, you." it was in prison when you finally made the decision to give up drugs. That's why we need to keep drugs illegal. And my perspective is quite the opposite. How do you two feel about, should there, ever, should there even be a drug war? Should drugs have been made illegal? Because, you know, back in the 19th century, you know, heroin was, you could buy it at the, 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 you know, at the store. You know, it was not a, not a criminal thing. What do you folks, what do you two feel about that? And do, do you think that you would have been better off had drugs not been part of the legal system, but just been, you know, obviously you were dealing with personal issues. But tell me, you know, what your thoughts about that are. Um, I would say never, uh, we should never give up the war on drugs. Um, drugs is tearing apart families. It's killing people. Um, it is incarcerating people. Um, women are incarcerated at three times higher rate than men in the state of Arizona. Um, but it's a war on drugs, right? It's not a war on people. Um, so just because I'm previously incarcerated, the, the war can't, shouldn't be against us, right? But you should not give up the fight um, against illegal drugs because um, Virginia and I are two, um, two shining examples of methamphetamine absolutely took everything from me and heroin took everything from her. Um, so uh, that's, and I'm, I'm not speaking for Virginia, I'm just saying we, we should not give up the fight against illegal drugs because it's, it's killing people, um, it's, it's killing families. Um, my youngest sister died of a drug overdose right before I got out of prison. So um, it's killed, it, it's costing people their lives. 
Well, I, I wasn't uh, trying to argue that drugs were not bad, okay? Okay. What I was trying to, to ask was that I think that drugs should not be part of the legal system, okay? The fact that you say it's tearing apart right. because it's illegal, okay? Right. I see what I, you're saying. I, I would like to see a world where, you know, um, if someone feels like, you know, they need to, I mean, once again, I think drugs need to be, are not a good solution, okay? And it's obvious that even if people, even if people weren't part of the legal system, they would still have problems in their life. But the drug war, which is making it illegal, is the thing that uh, uh, they're trying to solve a problem of, hey, people shouldn't take drugs by destroying people's lives and throwing them in prison. So the right. cure is far worse than the disease. That's why I wanted to get your perspective. Cause yeah. You know, well, yeah, you should be fighting the drugs, but not fighting the people. Exactly, that's, that's my point. So this is, a, this is a really good example, and I hope I'm able to answer your question. Um, the very first time I went to prison, I was 24 years old. I was arrested, with, so I was um, with a guy who sold a lot of heroin, a lot. And they were planning this big raid on him, and they, they missed it, right? So the, when the cops came and all the SWAT team came, they found no drugs except a $10 piece of heroin in my purse. And because they couldn't get what they had originally wanted to get, they arrested me for my $10 of heroin. And that judge sent me to prison the first time, which began the whole cycle of in and out. Because once you have a number in the state of Arizona, chances are you get arrested again, you are always going to go back to prison. Um, probation, rehab, anything like that is automatically off the table from the prosecutor's side when you get, if you reoffend. So yes. to answer your question, had I been offered rehab and they targeted the war on drugs, were targeting the dealers and not my little heroin habit, then yeah, it, it, then that's the fight we need to be fighting. How can we get people to rehab? How can we get those first or second or third time offenders um, who aren't who, who who are only substance abusers? How do we get them help? Because that that that's the way we help people, not by sending them to prison. Yeah, that's one of the so fault lines that are in the system. Yeah, that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So if I could just step in and say, I think what they're trying to say is that they believe that. Drug use should be destigmatized and not necessarily, it's not really about the drug war in their mind. It's about the stigmatization of you're a drug user, you're a criminal, go to prison, do not pass go. When oftentimes, to buy a phrase from Brandy, oftentimes drug users turn towards substance as a means of coping with things that they are unable to cope with. And the stigmatization of both mental health and self-soothing behaviors like using drugs are what leads us to be filling prisons with people who have more than just substance use issues. And because mental health is stigmatized and it's not treated in the same way that physical health is treated, we often see people go to prison when what they truly need is a rehab program that is designed for them. And so I can even tie it back to a previous question about how this record, how this is about human, humanist secularism. And I mean, there are plenty of people in our program for whom a specific denominational program would not work for them because they don't identify with any one particular faith or the tenets of humanism would resonate more with them than say, someone for who the Christian tenant would. And so stigmatization is really truly what we need to be fighting here, but both of mental health, drug addiction, people who have been uh, forced to endure traumas. And that's really where Brandy and Virginia are sort of coming from in this conversation, I think. I, I hope I'm not speaking for you guys, but. I think that ultimately is where the the line is. It's it's the stigma that gets attached to them just because, and just because they're a drug addict, just because they've been to prison. That sort of what Arrowhead is here to fight again. Thank yeah, you, I, I, I completely agree with you, and 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 I think that the idea of stigmatizing people that that's the source of the problem. And by and, and the worst stigma can be is throwing somebody in a cage, 
and then destroying their 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 future life. You know, so yeah, I, I, there are other countries like uh, um, that that have. Yeah, I mean, we're all we're starting to do that now here in this country, but uh, yeah, we're, Portugal we're, has yeah, decriminalized yeah. all. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, I also want to point out, I don't think they were trying to say anything. I understood very clearly. Yeah, that was a beautiful uh, community. I, I really love that. Thank you very much, guys. Um, if anyone needs or wants additional contact information for the Department of Corrections or Arrowette, uh, Kevin Hondo Hickman uh, of the Reason Risers uh, is willing to field those as well as going directly to uh, Arrowette. Uh, they're also holding a fundraiser at the conclusion of the pandemic to support Arrowette and their mission. Um, uh, and, and, and yes, I in general believe that uh, we are uh, harming people who are suffering and are treating that suffering with addictions, whether it's chemical addiction or behavioral addictions. Uh, those individuals need help and incarceration is not the solution. Uh, getting them the help is the solution. So excellent, excellent. Uh, and smart recovery, yes, <laughs> smart recovery. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So uh, any other questions before we wrap up the uh, recording? And again, you're all welcome to hang out and continue to ask questions and answers. I just want to uh, wrap it. If you appreciate the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix and would like to see more, then subscribe to our channel and check us out on Patreon. Links are in the description.